What is the meaning of life? This video is part of a series that considers uh, what is the meaning of life in terms of cognitive frameworks, which make up a language I call wondrous wisdom. I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. I have intended to make six episodes about this uh, meaning of life because the way these cognitive frameworks come together is quite sophisticated. And so I first gave an introduction, which was basically an overview, and then I talked about the two structures that uh, I'm intertwining, which is the learning cycle, the threesome for taking a stand, following through, reflecting, and the foursome, uh, four levels of knowledge, uh, knowing whether, knowing what, knowing how, knowing why. And then the third episode is supposed to show how Plato and St. Paul and Andrus, that's me, uh, look at this combination um, in different ways that permute each other. So I started recording that and then uh, it became quite long. So I have breaking that up into 3A, 3B, 3C. And this is 3B, the middle in this uh, episode. Uh, the beginning, I focused on Plato and I read excerpts from Plato's Republica. So if you catch up on that, uh, that's good. Maybe you've already read Plato's Republica. So you're welcome to just continue. And um, today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, how it all comes together um, in for Plato, the levels of knowledge. And then um, he has a value system that uh, will show uh, three different castes uh, in his republic. There's the subjects, there's the warriors, there's the rulers. And so uh, corresponding to being, doing, and thinking as modes in our soul, and modes in our human experience. And so I did give this picture. Uh, it does uh, show uh, how I think about uh, his three casts, that, uh, and he's exploring how our soul is divided, just like the city that he describes is divided. And I would call that the unconscious, the conscious, and the consciousness that uh, governs them. And the unconscious and conscious are very much like uh, the right and left uh, hemispheres of the brain. So sometimes we'll say there's a right hemisphere if you're left-handed, uh, which means you're going to be intuitive, uh, visual, creative. Uh, and there's a right-handed, uh, I'm sorry, there's a left-handed uh, hemisphere, which is very rational and conceptual and controlled, let's say. So, uh, and... Uh, there's psychologist uh, Daniel Kahneman has a book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. So there's these two types of thinking that uh, psychologists study, that what they call system one, system two. So I'm trying to say that there's a third system that relates these. And uh, accordingly, um, Plato is talking about uh, these three castes. And they have, uh, he gives them certain virtues. I'll call them values. Uh, but uh, the virtue that the subject should have should be moderation. But I did not emphasize that it's also something he ascribes to the warriors and to the rulers. All three should have moderation. And uh, similarly, uh, he ascribes uh, courage to the warriors. They need to be trained to uh, fear the right things uh, indelibly. <laughs> uh, but the rulers go through the same training, and they should also have this courage. But wisdom is only expected to be in the rulers, uh, and they were chosen because they had that aptitude for wisdom. So now I'll continue uh, with uh, a diagram that overviews how everything comes together, and then I'll relate that to the meaning of life. This slide pulls everything together. And so I'm using different colors. I hope you can see colors. Um, but uh, they are grouped together. And so here's the legend on the left-hand side. And you can see the diagram here in the middle with uh, 
the structure of the foursome, the four levels of knowledge, and um, various concepts that can be organized by them, right? So for me, for wondrous wisdom, um, I think of it as the foursome. And you'll see that in green, and I'll point that out here. There's a levels of knowledge, whether, what, how, why, and why being the broadest. And so that's knowledge of everything. You, If you know why, you're kind of rising above and able to put it all together. You understand all the relationships. You understand the holistic point of view. We don't have that kind of godly knowledge directly, right? I mean, we're aiming to be able to, and we do have this slot in our mind. We can, we allow for that. Like we can pretend we have that knowledge, you know, which is a lot already. Um, so we have a slot for that. It's it's uh, absolute knowledge and it's, it's quite, uh, we could say indirectly experienced, right? It's something we suppose. What we experience directly would be this how and the what, you can know anything. You can uh, function and and make and use and like operate with blueprints. Okay, in which case uh, we don't see the sensory knowledge, uh, but you can focus on the sensory knowledge. But then you know something. Okay, you know what, and this is our day to day experience. Um, and this would be the the unconscious knows. I mean, the conscious knows how. Um, at least it's working with this algorithmic knowledge of how. And the uh, unconscious is producing what? Now, it does get a little bit maybe more complicated or subtle than that because, like, um, we know how to ride a bicycle, but we don't know how to do that explicitly, right? So if we could do it explicitly, then, like, we may know the laws of angular momentum, then that would be knowledge how, okay? Uh, so that's something also to discuss, like, what's going on there with that type of tacit knowledge. And what is, uh, let's say, the unconscious is producing, these ideas are seeping into our brain, these images are thrust into our brain, uh, these sounds, um, but uh, they don't explain themselves, right? Like the retina is wonderfully rich in terms of the images, presented, but it doesn't explain how it built up those images, how they relate to what's at, whatever's out there. And whatever's out there remains a mystery. It's this level of weather. It's this absolute ignorance. You know, these things absolutely disconnected. In a certain sense, we just don't know. So uh, that's my understanding, how I write it out. Now, of course, Plato was one of the sources where I kind of was able to start thinking that there could be this kind of framework out there, right? It's just not obvious to us. We may be, I expect that, I imagine that we think about these things in the womb, these concepts are not so uh, uh, unusual. You know, a, a, a child in the womb can be hearing their mother's heartbeat and maybe their own heartbeat and they may be thinking about how, you know, or they may be experiencing what, or they may be even contemplating, meditating, like, well, why am I here? What's, you know, and then they may think like whether, like whether there is a mother or not, baby may contemplate right philosophy what else are you doing in the womb I mean, that's what maybe i could understand so those are experience of knowledge this is uh wondrous wisdom one of the key activities in wondrous wisdom is to document how our experience uh, fits together and a lot of you know the key principle is to try to remove the experience have minimized experiments just like in science you want to have a controlled environment. You want to eliminate all the clutter and all the noise and everything. You want to set up, you know, a quiet white room, which is stable and where, you know, where you could hang two spheres and see how they affect each other gravitationally and say, like, you really have to remove a lot of clutter. So in the same way, uh, to understand how we experience knowledge, we want to remove, you know, 99.99% of all the knowledge and just see little traces of it, what's happening with it. This, I think, uh, explains that. Uh, and these arrows basically say that the mind very freely shifts from knowledge of how, like the function, to knowledge of something, like the what, which just kind of takes less energy. Um, so architects have this phrase, you know, form follows function. Like when you figure out, you know, when you implement the function uh, of your building, the form will result naturally. That's at least the, 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 the one of the guiding principles. If that form needs to reflect the function, you can't 
you otherwise you'll just mess things up you know if you just build a facade it's not going to help the building function and then the building will not last long if it doesn't serve any function so that if you have this shift that means that you will have a shift uh, from you know that sets up a shift from let's say the consciousness this knowledge of why uh, the consciousness can go away because the consciousness is actually like a break it's keeping the how from becoming what so once the consciousness is happening, say, okay, hardwire it, then the consciousness, you know, flickers out, and then it can, it can come back, let's say. But what do we experience? A lot of what Plato's talking about is kind of like looking at this whole system from the side. And so um, these are very subtle things. That's why I'm trying to go through it myself and then kind of like see, can I make it understandable to others? Can I re-inspect it myself? Uh, or what are the new things to notice and to learn? So that was me. But let's look at um, how Plato looks at these relationships with knowledge. That's in black here. And so I'm positioning them outward here. So he talks about uh, four levels. And this is in various parts of Republic, um, the book, uh, in, in, in um, maybe more towards the end. He starts talking about knowledge. Um, and the highest being reason, and then understanding, and then conviction, and then, let's say, perception of shadows. So he's kind of describing this by analogy. He had already given this analogy of uh, the, the person in the cave, you know. So here's again somebody 2,500 years ago, in order to make his point, he's so creative, he invents motion pictures. Okay. Now, maybe, I mean, he sets it up in a cave, um, they have a, you know, let's say a fire. They have a shadow puppet theater, you know, like where you, you make little dogs or whatever, right? Of course, it's more elaborate. They have actors. And then they have people chained, you know, to watch them, right? And these people are raised. All they see is this puppet theater. You know, they just see images flashed on a screen, right? So it's kind of like uh, people grew up in a virtual reality, right? And so one day, one of these people's chained gets free, and wanders out, and they wander out of the cave. And they have flash, you know, of the sun. It's just so bright and everything. Can't even see anything, but slowly, slowly start to make sense of things. You start to see like this whole reality that kind of makes sense. You know, there's these colors, there's these shapes. Uh, they have causal relations. Uh, you can think in terms of, let's say, objects, uh, maybe some kind of laws of physics. Uh, and so, and then it goes back into the cave, right? And um, they they say, well, where were you? you, you this is what you missed. Right? <laughs> He's trying to explain, or she's trying to explain, you know, hey, these are just images. This is just unreal. But you see, nobody nobody believes the person because um, they're all invested in the images. And they praise people who can explain the images. You see, if you're not in tune with the images on the screen, uh, like, you know, who's the star and who's the... You know, what is this about and what, what happened in previous episode that you may have missed or whatever. So you haven't been paying attention. You're not going to be explaining it in a way that's interesting to people. Whereas someone say, look, these are just shadows. Right? Like there's a fire beyond there. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> so it's just because it just shows the problem. And of course, this is an allegory to show the problem that a philosopher like Socrates or Plato faces or, you know, wondrous, let's say with one. I'm trying to say there's this language of wondrous wisdom. You all use it. Don't you realize and people just say, what are you talking about? I don't see it, right? So it's very um, great to see somebody like Kirby, you know, who's uh, got a bachelor's uh, in philosophy from Princeton University, and he's a key participant in the math for wisdom community. We exchange letters back and forth. He helped get our discussion going. In the beginning, he was, you know, skeptical in a friendly way. It's just like, well, you know, just tolerant. <laughs> but then slowly, 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 like, well, maybe, hey, like, maybe maybe Ender's actually talking about something. Like maybe there's some, you know, sense to it. Maybe there's some pattern. So slowly like Kirby's kind of like saying, maybe we there's something beyond this cave, right? Maybe Andres did see something outside the cave, right? So at least some kind of friendly start to respect, you know, start to appreciate, you know, care, like a little bit more uh, become growingly sympathetic, right? Maybe you are too. This is what I'm trying to say. And that's why I'm doing this is to... Um, make this possible. So I can relate to Plato, he can relate to me, and maybe you can uh, relate likewise. So then after giving that allegory later on, he's talking about um, 
how to uh, explain these four levels of knowledge. So he's saying on the one hand, um, but he's doing it kind of allegorically, he's saying, look, the sun in the physical world makes becoming visible, okay? So let's see, how does this work? Um, there's one level, like, okay, so he gives the example of, let's say, reflecting in the pool of water, you know, there are these sensory images, you know, let's say I, I see my, you know, I have a face, right? But if I look in the water, my face may appear, but kind of distorted with ripples and waves, you know. So uh, similarly with shadows, you know, my, my body can cast a shadow or your body can cast a shadow. So those reflections of images, like that's just basically unreal. Um, and that's, it's kind of like ignorance. Like if you're just focusing on the shadow, you're just completely ignorant. <laughs> you know? It's not about the shadow. It's about like what the shadow is the shadow of, right? So just to be focusing on the shadow or the surface, the colors on the surface of the water, right? Like that's a, like there is no person in the in the lake. Like because who's that person in the in the lake, right? Like, like there's no person in the lake. That is a shadow, right? Like so. But then conviction would be like so. There's the original. There's a the copy. That's a copy, right? But the original is something, let's say, out there. That would be um, the difference between whether and what, right? There's no, whether there's a person in the lake would be a question mark. But what does the person look like? Like that's uh, that's the sensory image that he's talking about things that are, you know, for, for which the problem of whether has been solved, let's say. But this is really by analogy to say that um, in another world, there's... Um, also the copy in the original. So there are all these, um, let's say, uh, sciences, basically. All these knowledge bases, like carpentry, let's say, but, but geometry especially, um, where uh, geometry knows all kinds of truths, okay? And, or, or hypotheses, or, or, you know, there's these, what I could call blueprints, let's say, right? That's the understanding. So if you know um, how to... Um, work with geometry, let's say, um, I don't know, finance, you know, you know how to work with uh, biology or uh, music, right? You have these different sciences or disciplines. Then within that science, you could do anything. You know, you know all the principles, right? But he's saying that's just a copy. Each science is just a copy of the ultimate science. Okay, so he says, like, you have an understanding of music. You have an understanding of um, mathematics. But there's an understanding of understanding, let's say. There's a reason, right? And what is reason doing? What is the reason, uh, the faculty that's behind all these different uh, capabilities of understanding, uh, which are just copies of reason? So reason is understanding, appreciation of contradiction, of dialectic, which would be like teasing out different things, you know, teasing out what's true and what's false and what are the different components, you know, contributing things, how do they fit together? And thus uh, appreciating the absolute truth, being able to uh, get out of any particular context. So context is something that our participants, Dave Gray, um, let's say Kirby, Erner, John Brett, they will talk about. And so I try to say, look, uh, Wondrous wisdom is a science about context. So there may be no context, like with those reflections or shadows, you know, it's like they're just completely not in any relevant context. There could be some context where, you know, you have a person in a landscape, right? You could be any context. So um, like any particular science, uh, but there could be like every context, knowledge of every context, right? So. That's what the reason is able to do. It's able to help you step out of a context, create a context, and appreciate, like, what is the context that you can never run away from? Like, what is the context of absolute truth that's always with you? When you empty your, you know, mind of all experience, when you unplug the unconscious, when you let go of all your assumptions, let go of all your uh, so-called principles, unplug the conscious, and just see, okay, what's left? And what's left is, I think, uh, the machinery for Relating those, uh, like what Dave Gray and others would call, like, you know, the correspondence theory of truth. You have facts that the unconscious is presenting. You have uh, principles, um, 
statements that the conscious is making and do they accord? Well, the, unco the, the consciousness is what is managing, uh, caring about that accord. Uh, and so these things of contradiction, dialectic, absolute truth, uh, of the first principle of the whole, the good, you know, but especially this idea of the whole, right? And so the good makes being intelligible. So just like the sun makes becoming visible, um, so how things change, like you know, the, the change in the universe, you know, so why did, uh, you know, why did the sun appear on the left side of your face or the center of your face or the back of your head? Because you've been moving with respect to the sun, right? So things are becoming in, in this kind of like, and so if you, if you're on these lower levels, you're learning about all the becoming of appearances, you're able to describe how things seem and like the knowledge of what is the knowledge of seeming. And you rise above that uh, to the knowledge of how and why. You see, so knowledge of how can operate seeming. Like knowledge of how is like how you need to stand in order to have the sun in your face or away from your face if you're photographing, right? If you're a photographer, like what's the knowledge of the how? See, but the knowledge of the why is like, well, why do we make photographs? You know, what's the whole point? So why do we live our lives? And so that's about not things becoming in this world of seeming, but what are the things that ultimately are, right? What is being all about? And so this absolute being is this known by the why. The why is able to know this absolute being. The understanding um, for each discipline is able to, let's say, connect that in the world of appearances, right? But it's doing that through copies, right? Copies of the good. So like what is good in different situations, in different contexts? The uh, geometer knows what's good for geometry. The carpenter knows what's good for carpentry. But those are just copies. But the philosopher king, the ruler, uh, the philosopher queen, let's say, is able to, uh, uh, the philosopher princes and princesses, let's say, they're able to um, work with the whole. So this is on the levels of knowledge, right? Then, um, and those are relationships with knowledge. That's from Plato's uh, view, his vocabulary. Now, in blue, I have comparative evaluation of knowledge. So that would be, um, uh, oh, again, terms for the level of knowledge. So he gave, um, the, what was in black, uh, these relationships of knowledge, that's from the back of his book. Now, I drew, uh, and maybe I use more directly, uh, the levels of knowledge um, as I was discussing in terms of ignorance, false opinion, true opinion, wisdom, right? So he was talking about the knowledge in with regard to each caste or system, etc. So, so ignorance being the knowledge of not being, which is basically, you know, the ignorance of, of you know, the total ignorance, right, of that which not is. Um, and so in my case, I'm saying like, well, the city exists without anybody knowing about it, let's say, right? They, they might even notice we live in a city, right? So in a certain sense, like that is uh, that that is able to uh, be there without any uh, knowledge or anything. In a certain sense, so it's interesting the way he talks about knowing and being. It's maybe almost the opposite of how I would do it. But so these questions of like, let's say, what is or is what's not, like whether, right? Like whether there's a city or not, like in a certain sense, it's kind of irrelevant, you know, from his point of view like do people really need to know that there's a city the city would function perhaps with without you know it just kind of you know, does its thing right so that's on the, the that whole thing knowledge of that would be wisdom though, like knowledge of that whole. so then false opinion which is um what the craftsmen and the peasants and such go through and and see they have this variety of opinions uh, so the false opinion is the one that uh isn't uh, indelible it's able it's changeable you know and so he says well in a democracy people like to follow fashions and they like to you know be very noticeable and they like to attract attention um and so um they're receptive to the manifold they're blind to the absolute you know and they're very fickle imitative so i i have i recall him um and i couldn't find the quote but that's the idea that it's like a marketplace of opinions. You know, you wear one opinion one day, you wear another opinion another day. They're like clothing that you wear according to your fashion and your style, right? So we see that in our politics, right? People just dressing up uh, 
whatever, according to the fashions. Then a uh, true opinion, though, is that indelibility, like, you know, that then presumably like that the right opinion has been indelibly embraced, like where people are hanging on to the right thing. They may not know why they have that opinion, but they know how to kind of like uh, adhere to it, cling to it, and, and persist with it, uh, which you need, like if you're doing a scientific experiment, you need to be sticking to your hypothesis, at least until you've conducted your experiment, right? You need to be able to follow, you know, keep follow through, go through with it. So in conformity with law about real and false dangers, okay? So to know what's really dangerous, um, you could say to your soul, and what's not really dangerous, uh, death maybe is not really dangerous. Uh, that's something Jesus would say. We'll cover that later, let's say. We're doing Plato. Same, same logic. And then wisdom being wide awake, this knowledge of being, right? This attractiveness to true beauty, you know, things that are beautiful of their own sake, you know, of their inner harmony, right? Or maybe external harmony. So now, what is the virtues? Um, how are they um, enabled by the knowledge? Um, well, enabled by the knowledge, how are they reflecting and fostering the harmony of knowledge, right? And so this is where um, now uh, we're adding some color to these uh, four levels of knowledge. So the, what I mean by color, because I color it in, is these uh, three colors for taking a stand, following through, reflecting, taking a stand, following through, reflecting. It's, it's the, the feeling of being or doing or thinking, what mode are we in? Where are we in that learning cycle? And so the idea that I kind of notice is that, well, when he talks about the, the values, or he might say virtues of these different um, uh, castes, these different parts of the soul, these different faculties in the soul, um, they each manifest, you know, one of those three colors, right? And so uh, let's go through, like, well, so thinking, let's say, is what would relate like with the, the wisdom, Right? So wisdom for him is like this watchfulness, the knowledge which presides over justice, love of the vision of the truth. So when you have this wisdom, I think of it as very kind of like reflective. You know, it's very much related to this mode of thinking. Like these philosophers are sitting there thinking. Right? <laughs> okay. But the courage uh, is, um, those are the guardians, the ones who were receptive to the training, but really didn't have this uh, great curiosity, like, well, why? Right? Like they, they didn't... Um, you know, they're brave and they're courageous, uh, they're good fighters, um, they're uh, stubborn, let's say, they're persistent, uh, they don't give up, but um, they're not clamoring for the big picture. So they're not really a, a suited for um, ruling uh, the, the whole, you know, mastering the big picture. So they are, but they do know how, they do know how to fight. Okay, and, 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 and that means um, doing the right, you know, when the context is given for them, like, you know, operating properly in that context. So they're indelibly fixed by the preparation, giving them by their training. And then um, moderation. Okay, so that would be doing, you know, they're able to follow through. Okay. The, the, the wisdom, the wise ones are able to uh, reflect and adjust. They say they're able to look soberly and saying there's something wrong. There's a problem. We need to pursue this. We need to deal with this. We need to work with this, right? So um, they're reflecting about that, you know, appraising the persuasion. Now, uh, the peasants, the craftsmen, the ordinary people, uh, these should have the value of moderation, you know, which would be obedience, uh, uh, self-control, receptive to guidance, having simple and moderate desires, uh, not complex and manifold, you know, willing just to keep things simple. You know, this is not where they would go on their own accord, but to say like, um, in a healthy person, you know, they have healthy passions, they're moderate, uh, they, they're, they're, uh, they're purposeful, not of their own choosing, let's say, but because they're growing nicely, they've been pruned nicely, uh, they look healthy, right? It's not like an unhealthy plant that is just kind of crawling all over and just, but looks sick because it's just not well cared for, um, not fertilized and not watered and just uh, just on its own. So uh, for this plant to kind of like be um, the product of self-discipline, right? And to be... Um, 
harmonious with the discipline imposed, imposed on it, to be receptive of discipline, right? Uh, to have a, and I, maybe you have that inside of you, maybe you're a good kid in some sense, you know, of course, you know, we have both sides, like a good kid, bad kid, but the good kids say like, I don't mind having a structure put on me, you know, I'm willing to play within a system, I'm willing to play within uh, the rules, I just please make them clear, you know, so that I could uh, abide by them. And so, in fact, the fact that you're willing to embrace that, right, that you're willing to be obedient, you know, that you have like a voice that says, oh, oh just let me know and I'll, I'll be obedient. You know, call on me and I will not respond with doubts, right? Call me and I will respond, right? So that's uh, moderation. And the idea is that that's uh, the mode of being, okay? You do not have this reflection that gets in the way. You do not have this action that keeps you from... You're ready to respond. You're waiting to be called. You're obedient, Okay. And you just are. And so that's the voice where we really feel like we're one of the gang, you know, one of the family, you know, we belong. Okay. Because, um, because uh, we don't rock the boat, you know, we're in the boat, we're happy in the boat. <laughs> so we're not wandering away, like we're with the sheep, right? We're good sheep. And then finally, uh, justice has, you know, very much that same type of mode of being. You know, it's the being of the whole. The point being, the city is not supposed to be in action, let's say, you know, or in uh, reflection. The city is supposed to be comfortable being, very much like the common people. And then, so they have the same color, so to speak, in my system. So justice is the harmony of one's inner life that we read about, orderly government of one part over another, like who's supposed to be in charge, each doing their own business, right? And so um, that's uh, that's all put together. And having uh, thought about all these things, and so I, at least I hope that you can see the philosophical issue to say, well, there's these levels of knowledge, there's four of them, I'm claiming, but there's three modes of um, learning, modes of participating, which is being, doing, thinking, and they kind of color this in a particular way, and the question is, well, why that way? Does it have to be that way? Then the answer will be, well, there are permutations in different value systems starting with St. Paul, and then I add a third. Okay, so there's actually three permutations um, possible. I will talk about those uh, later because we have talked a lot. I have talked a lot. You have listened a lot. So, um, but again, like, you know, those is like firstness, secondness, thirdness. Uh, we've been talking about Pierce. So, you know, he, and, you know, he drew that from Kant, uh, but uh, you can see the firstness, secondness, thirdness here, that the unconscious, the peasants, they kind of just see themselves, you know, they, it's almost like they don't generally see the warriors or think about the warriors or the rulers. They're in their own world. They don't need that. The question is like whether they are governed or whether they are not, you know, and then my answer from Plato is that, well, if they're left to their own devices, you know, it's just going to be weird social diseases coming out of there, you know, and they'll end up with tyranny basically because they're victims, uh, easy victims of tyrants. But instead, um, you should have somebody who uh, is introducing discipline, introducing law, you know, maintaining the law. So that would be these guardians, these warriors, they're maintaining the law. But they can have an awkward relationship, you know, where the guardians are overdoing it, let's say, right? And the guardians are not uh, appreciating, you know, the legitimate uh, needs and concerns of represented by the unconscious. Uh, and then um, they can have a twisted relationship, like where, you know, the unconscious is using these warriors to implement its rules, you know, upon itself. Like you have principles that become kind of like uh, prejudices, let's say, you know. And so you can have this whole morass of prin so-called principles that are really just prejudices. We see that in ourselves. So what we need is rulers who would tease that out and say, you know, make sure that we're not just being victims of prejudices, being victims of false principles, but that uh, the, the, the faculty that's imposing discipline on us is actually operating with true healthy principles, right? Who can figure that out? So there has to be another voice, the consciousness, which is taking those two hemispheres in the brain and introducing this harmony, hopefully. So here we have it all. But um, in a couple of videos, I will uh, take it a step further and talk about version two, where I'll slightly reorganize it. Basically, like I will explain that wisdom 
actually how we experience it uh, internally, you know, with these colors. Without the colors, it, 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 we experience it the way it is. But when you introduce these colors, we experience wisdom as a feeling of beauty. Okay, and that's also like related to thinking, you know. But um, it's this lovely uh, thinking. But that becomes, um, let's see, that becomes the what. So that becomes the guide, you know, is, you know, of the beautiful principles. Like the principles that are right and honest, everything is like if they're all beautiful. But the why, like why is everything, why is there justice? will be because we have a well-disciplined, well-trained, unconscious, you know, well-managing democracy of these uh, citizen farmers, let's say, like in the U.S. when it started, who are um, mo truly moderate, like, you know, which means that their concern may be not about, so. I mean, they have a healthy concern for their self-interest, which includes a healthy concern for the collective interest, which includes a healthy concern for the constitution, the rules, and a healthy concern for the principles beyond that, and maybe even a healthy concern for God beyond that, you see. So if you have a, a very well-disciplined unconscious, it is the reason why we, um, you know, we have justice, why we have harmony. So that's a completely different way to kind of flip it around, and maybe that's one that we want to um, uh, really appreciate, and from as far as being human beings. Because what Plato is describing makes sense, uh, but not really for human beings, let's say, right, in terms of humanity. It's the idea being that it's our consciousness really needs to play a lot strongly on our unconscious. Our unconscious really needs to be, let's say, loved by our parents, uh, by others around us. Our unconscious needs to be uh, really wired with all this healthy um self-stimulus, all this healthy seeds of uh, of um, goodness uh, so that it can be, um, in a certain sense, self-ruling, right? Like, so the consciousness has something to play with, you know? And so I think that's the question is like, how much of that goodness is actually embedded in our unconscious, which probably has a lot to do with, you know, how much have we been loved? Right. Hopefully, how much is there a loving God, you know, a loving universe, uh, loving society? Um, so that'll be in pink. I have here experience of virtues as sources of personal internal harmony. So this helps to describe the virtues. But what do they actually um, what do they actually look like? Right. So. We're um, concluding for this day because I think we'll have to give uh, St. Paul another day and myself another day and put it all together. But so this system I've written here, as Plato describes it, justice, moderation, courage, wisdom. I'm trying to explain it's fitting into this. Uh, uh, in the future video, we'll talk more about like how it relates. And so we've come this far uh, trying to explain in Plato's words, how are there these four levels of knowledge and how are there these three colors of the learning cycle? And you can imagine that there will be a permutation. And since the cycle only moves in one direction, uh, the colors will only change in one direction. So there should be three systems. So next time I'll explain how St. Paul uh, has um, a value system. And then I'll explain like, well, there got to be a third value system. So let me just show you the slides uh, because you've come this far. So for St. Paul, he has the hymn to love. That's in uh, Corinthians, I think maybe... First Corinthians, let's see. And so he talks a beautiful thing about love. Uh, and maybe just to emphasize that he does say about uh, partially knowing like children, but ultimately there will be this full knowledge that we will know fully just as we are known fully by God now. Right? We will be participating in this kind of holistic knowledge. So this is this knowledge why, right? And so he has this hymn. Uh, and he says that uh, there are these three virtues, uh, faith, hope, love. But in the end, uh, it's really about love, you know, this total knowledge. But we can flip that around and say, but meanwhile, we're children. We have partial knowledge. And when you have partial knowledge, faith and hope are extremely relevant. Okay? Once we have total knowledge, like love, it all makes sense. He has a beautiful uh, description of that. And so this love, what he talks about, it's the unity that coheres with all. So the things that love is, 
imply that we're all related, all of us with each other. We're all the same person we, with the same God, with the same God in us and beyond us and, you know, amongst us. And it's all cohering as one. And then when you have that outlook, um, you get these things where love. And like, so without love, then there's just disconnects. And when you have these disconnects, you have lack of meaning, words without meaning. Uh, you can have uh, knowledge or faith that... Um, disconnected with who we are we can have like actions like even selfless actions that just really aren't helpful to us because we don't we're disconnected and so we don't enjoy in that coherence so uh when we're disconnected you know all these things like envy and boasting and pride and behaving inappropriately seeking our own way focus on evil you know like and failing see love does not fail because love is this just bigger picture so then we'll have these, and then we'll start to see how I start to rename them. So instead of faith, I'll talk about believing. And then I'll say, well, I'll say courage and hope are virtues in the sense that they are, and it's a technical term I use, but to say that they're like immortal. They're like not really in us, but they're like, we have like these little treasure chests in our soul where we, let's say, collect these virtues that we manifest. When we manifest courage, we manifest hope. They're storing in these uh, stored treasure chests of our of our virtues, and they're forever. Okay, and so love is not really just coherence, but like for us, it's actually the feeling is very important. There's a feeling of love, and like in the case of wisdom, we experience it as a feeling of beauty in a certain sense. So it's why, but I I emphasize these are positive emotions, right? When you experience a positive emotion, um, it also kind of means like you're doing something right, okay. Or you're thinking right, you're you're being right in some kind of absolute sense. Okay, so this kind of like a manifestation of God is happening. Let's say when you when you have that positive emotion, like the feeling of beauty is saying that there's no inside; it's all outside, right? Like so, I I, I become insignificant inside; it's all outside, and so there can be no disgust because disgust is from the inside. If there's no disgust, you get these afterglow of like, well, then it's all beautiful. You know, it's all lovely like you know so when you get sucked into this harmony outside of us disgust becomes impossible it has to be beautiful necessarily and love is likewise a feeding like if hate hate comes from anger uh and, and depression and relief they all come from expecting what we don't wish for but if this that type of negativity that type of negation where it's impossible to expect what you don't wish for you see then if that's ruled out, then you get this afterglow, this beautiful feeling of the loving feeling that, well, everything is positive in the sense that everything's only about like what we do wish for. And so when you're experiencing that, it's because of this godly, absolute, necessary, like impossibility of the opposite. So that's a positive moment. So it's a godly moment, but it's very fleeting, let's say. So what the virtues do is that we, you know, beauty of these, uh, let's say, the beauty as impressed upon us by the rulers make us indelibly prepared and courageous. We will act courageously when we hear that beauty. It's like resonating, right? And same way, like that feeling of love from our parents, from God, from our friends, from our loved ones, our sweethearts, you know, surrounding us, that'll inspire us to have hope, you know, this, this virtue of hope. But what sets that up well, there's the other two, like what's the relationship between justice and moderation? So I'm saying, well, it's really about being obedient, obeying, and it's internalizing. So I'm saying, you know, and I noticed uh, with St. Paul because of the colors. So he has three, if the levels of knowledge match up, this is the level missing, and it's an external perspective. So justice is on the outside, but we internalize it, we take it to heart by being moderate. Okay, we become participants in justice by being moderate, which means basically obeying, being obedient. So believing is like also an internalized view, like you have faith, you personally inside have faith. So what is on the outside? The idea is that it's loyalty. Okay, so here I talk about the virtues. And so what's the missing virtues? Like if courage lets us follow through on our stands, it points us forward, right? Hope lets us take a stand based on all the things we think about to take, you know, to say it's going to happen. You know, we're, we're looking forward to, you know, we're going to invest ourselves in the idea that it's going to happen. Okay. And we're going to follow through. Well, so the one that's missing is when you're able to reflect on what you did or what's, you know, what, what you've done and, 
that's honesty, right? To be able to reflect that. So that's the third virtue. That's, of course, my deepest value in life is living by truth. So honesty is very much a part of that. So I can develop my own. Um, there's me in the 1988 or 89 or thereabouts. Uh, um, and so honesty, then the idea is that, well, that's a reflecting. See, so that's, uh, you know, yellow is taking a stand, red is following through, blue is reflecting. And so if you do the permutation, uh, and it's very nice that, you know, Paul kind of like is compatible. So that was like a encouragement to say, oh, St. Paul's uh, virtues have the same scheme as Plato's, let's say, if I color them this way, where uh, believing is uh, reflecting, it's like thinking, love is like doing, and then hope is like being. So then I need to have a uh, external, internal point of view, internal, external, based on doing. Well, then that would be uh, caring and duty. That's the way I understand it. Okay. Like, do I care inside? Do I have a duty outside? I, I take my duty and I internalize it. Today. No, it's not just a duty on the outside. I actually care personally on the inside. Then if we internalize, then this feeling of being, and that would be the case when there's no outside. If there's no outside, there can be no fright because fright is of what is outside. If there's no fright, if that's impossible, then you start to feel this uh, intimacy in terms of, oh, you know, and intimacy would be this idea of being, right? Like, you know, the family feeling that, you know, hopefully if you have a good family, you feel intimate or you have a really personal, you know, loved one, spouse or sweetheart, right? true love. Hopefully you can have that intimacy. And so if you have that intimacy, then that sets you up. That could be fleeting, let's say. But it's this absolute positive, you know, emotion of where you actually feel. The, it's like the unconscious has, has uh, touched absoluteness, touched absolute truth. Maybe that's the way to think about it. Like that's how the unconscious registers absolute truth, through beauty and through this feeling of love and feeling of intimacy. So the feeling of love is very important not to be discounted, just like the feeling of beauty, the feeling of intimacy. And when you have that, that sets you up so that you can have honesty at the right time okay you'll resonate with honesty but um you know when the when the trigger is pulled you'll be honest but you see in order to load that gun let's say put the bullet in <laughs> that's probably not a very good picture but you know put in the arrow into the into the bow you have to internalize right you have to be yourself right so you have to say okay i have these duties but what am i going to care about right and if you're caring, you see, then you're able to uh, do that. So I'm learning. Maybe you're learning. Um, we have two more value systems to go. I wanted to give you a preview, though, at least. Um, so here we're on the third part, intertwining threesome and foursome, Plato, St. Paul, understand the meaning of life. Why don't we just agree like this was about Plato? I am Andres Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. I want to thank you uh, for... Uh, being wondrous, uh, being wise, uh, being a fellowship. Um, thank you for liking. Thank you for subscribing. Uh, thank you for supporting me through Patreon. And I want to um, just say a prayer that uh, however your value system, and I, perhaps it's all of these value systems, but that you're able to uh, internalize what you, uh, what you can of uh, what is harmonious, let's say. It's all about different types of harmony that we're able to participate in, and that that harmony uh, integrates you with what's beyond you, which includes God, includes other people, includes society, includes the ecology, includes the universe, includes the planet, includes nature, includes all life, living beings, um, includes maybe the afterworld, right, or includes the kingdom of heaven within this world. So, I pray that uh, you and I uh, build that connection outward, uh, that we appreciate our uh, unconscious, our conscious, our consciousness, that we unravel ourselves and re-ravel ourselves <laughs> and amongst ourselves and with ourselves. That's what I pray for you.